Brooke Johnson. I'm Executive Director of Cincinnati Preservation Association, and we are here at CMU to do the Historic Preservation Bike Ride this afternoon on Friday the 17th. And we're going to be going through over the Rhine, West End, over to Union Terminal, through downtown, and then back up through Pendleton and over the Rhine, looking at all sorts of historic buildings, talking about the history of Cincinnati, talking about infill development, as well as some kind of urban renewal that has happened and some of the, the repercussions for that, as well as some of our major um, historic preservation projects of our National Historic Landmarks. Yeah, hi, my name is Kathy Cunningham. I'm the president of Queen City Bike, and we're a local grassroots advocacy organization. We think biking should be safe and fun and accessible for everybody who wants to do it. And so we love to, to partner with, with allied organizations like Cincinnati Preservation Association. This is an example of a, a type of event that we like to create where um, people can get out on their neighborhood streets, explore our beautiful city, and discover all the ways that they can get around that they might not have known about. Um, and they get to meet other bike positive fun people and, and expand their network. Welcome everyone to uh, the CNU Preservation Bike Ride. My name is Beth Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Cincinnati Preservation Association. We are Greater Cincinnati's nonprofit that's dedicated to the education and advocacy of historic preservation um, in the Greater Cincinnati area, which covers um, Cincinnati and the surrounding counties, Northern Kentucky, and a bit of um, Southeast Indiana as well. It's a nine county region that we cover. Um, this, is, um, this bike ride is actually based on a bike ride that we did last year. Um, Queen City Bike and um, CPA, Cincinnati Preservation, has teamed up the last couple years for a preservation bike ride because it is both preservation month and bike month. And so old, old house lovers and bike lovers are a, um, an obvious marriage of individuals that love urban environments and love looking at beautiful things. So it's been a great success and we're gonna be continuing it. We just did this year's last Friday or last Saturday. Um, and so right now we're here in, um, in Pyatt Park. This is Cincinnati's oldest park. Um, it is um, right behind, well, so if you, for those that are over here, if you wanna come over this way, this is Cincinnati's City Hall. Um, it's back here. It's, that, it's a big, big building um, just down there. Um, and then this is Pyatt Park, which basically is a park that connects the um, east side and west side of downtown. Um, it also, sometimes people do call it Garfield Park um, and not Pyatt Park because of, um, well, it's actually William Henry Harrison. I think Garfield's at the other end. Um, so Ohio, Ohio is also known as the birthplace of presidents. So we do have, I think, we have monuments of all of the presidents from Ohio somewhere in the city. Um, and so that's William Henry Harrison. Um, so this area is not necessarily a historic district, but we do have a lot of historic buildings that are designated local landmarks. Um, the church, um, there, the um, Cincinnati um, City Hall, there's Plum Street Temple um, that we, we kind of passed um, when we came down here. Um, Cincinnati has 27 local historic districts and 52 national register districts. Um, and then they have 82 local landmarks in over 250 individually listed buildings on the National Register. And that's just within the city of Cincinnati. That's not including our entire region. So as we go through today, we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking a lot about historic preservation, what Cincinnati has done, as well as we're gonna see a lot of different infill because that's actually been a big part of our preservation story recently is trying to really fill in the teeth that have been previously demolished 
Um, so we'll be talking a lot about some of the infill development and how it um, meets the needs of the community, is context sensitive, and all of, all of that. If there's questions that you guys have along the way, please feel free to ask. I am a pretty good Cincinnati historian. I can't promise I'll know everything, but I do, do know a lot, especially about the architecture, and I think probably some of our other guides here might, might know some trivia as well um, if I don't. We basically went from the very east side of downtown to the west side of downtown. So we're kind of mostly on the western, western edge of downtown right now. Um, so this is the Time Star building. Um, a lot of people know Cincinnati for our Italianate architecture. That's kind of what Cincinnati has famously been known for. Um, we have the largest collection of Italianate brick structures in the country. You guys will see it when we go through over the Rhine. <laughs> um, but we also have an amazing collection of Art Deco. Um, this, as you can see, is a beautiful building. I love that you guys are all getting your cameras out and taking pictures of our beautiful buildings. Um, so this is the Time Star building. It used to be the Time Star is a newspaper um, here in Cincinnati. It's now actually family court um, for Hamilton County. And so um, they've actually done a really great job of reusing this space for the courtrooms. Um, a lot of the fabric inside has been retained and has been preserved. Um, the building is beautiful. This is also a local landmark and a national landmark. Um, and right now I've been working with them because the biggest concern is they need to clean the building. You can definitely see there's kind of some of the black stuff um, and growth and stuff on the building. So hopefully we're hoping later this summer um, they're going to be able to clean it and it will kind of shine. So next time you're here, um, definitely swing by and the building will probably be a little bit brighter. So Cincinnati is interesting when it comes to the Great Depression. So obviously Great Depression started in 1930, right? Well, uh, the Emery's who were a major family here in Cincinnati, anyone that's staying at the hotel, the Emery's built that. Anyone that has gone out to Marymount, the Emery's built that. So they're kind of the family that built Cincinnati in a way. And um, John Emery, actually took all of his money out of the stock market about six months before it crashed because that's how the hotel got built. He underwrote this to get this built. And so part of the reason we have some of these amazing buildings where nowhere else is getting stuff like this during that time period was because he pulled all of, he just didn't trust the banking system and he gambled right. <laughs>
the Pendleton neighborhood. Um, it's slightly confusing, Pendleton neighborhood, but over the Rhine Historic District. The over the Rhine Historic District actually covers four different neighborhoods or parts of four different neighborhoods. Um, but this is um, Pendleton, which is um, a mixed use neighborhood, residential, commercial. Um, it's really kind of, it's a really um, dense urban um, area. There, you're gonna get a lot of corner stores and then residential in between. Um, this obviously used to be a church. Um, it is no longer a church, but it's an event center. And that is one thing in, um, I'm sure like most of your cities, uh, churches, their um, congregants have been declining. A lot of them don't have um, congregants or have parishes or um, communities there anymore. And so finding creative reuses has been um, a struggle. Like I think most cities, this has been a really successful event center. Um, we have another one on Washington Park that's an event center. We have another one that was a beer hall. Um, the beer hall's left, but the new restaurant's gonna be going in there. And so um, it's important for us to keep these buildings and to find good reuses for them because they are such important landmarks within each neighborhood. One of the great things about Over the Rhine is you see the steeples of the churches all over. Um, how many people were able to go to Rheingeist and go to the rooftop yesterday? So that's like one of the, it's such a iconic um, over the Rhine look is all of the different steeples. So trying to find those good reuses has been great. Um, this neighborhood has a lot of affordable housing in it and they've been doing a really good job. Model Group is a, uh, Model Group and Urban Sites are both local developers actually both housed in over the Rhine as well um, that have concentrated a lot on low income and affordable housing. And so what's great is a lot of it has been mixed use. And so you'll get a building where like maybe half of them are affordable, half of them are market rate, and you just can't tell. And so, um, so that's one that's been one really, really great thing about this neighborhood is that they've been able to keep that healthy mix as well. Um, and then one, one building that's one of my favorites, um, if you look right down the end of the street, you'll see that white building right there. Um, that, that's a, an old bathhouse. Um, does anybody in their cities have old bathhouses? Do you guys know what these were? So old bathhouses were like, so, you know, and the, they didn't have indoor plumbing here. And so they needed to go somewhere to get clean. Um, and so they would have bathhouses around the neighborhood. And so a lot of them are no longer here. They were things that were often demolished, but that one has, was saved and it's actually now a residence. And so they actually did an adaptive reuse to turn it into a single family house. And so it was a really great project. Um, there were some interesting things they had to do. There was still like baths inside, so they had to fill those in, um, but they were able to find a, a great reuse and find um, someone to be able to take that building and give new life to it. It had been vacant, it had been a church, um, but really underutilized for a long time. So the question was, what do we have here to fund preservation? Um, so uh, definitely like the public-private partnerships, but ta historic tax credits has really been the thrust of the rehabilitation movement here. In 2016, Over the Rhine, as a neighborhood, actually won a national award for its use of tax credits. It was the first time ever that this award was given to a non-individual building award. Most of the times this award was only given to individual buildings. It was given to the entire neighborhood because between 2008, when the first kind of new construction rehab project happened on Vine Street until 2016, like the amount of historic tax credits was unprecedented anywhere else in the country. Um, Cincinnati still to this day has the highest, highest percentage of tax credits per capita anywhere else in the country. Ohio is second in the use of historic tax credits in the country behind New York. You can't really fight with New York City. Um, so historic tax credits is something that's been really important. We also have a really good state tax credit as well, and so when you combine both of those, um, you can get up to 45% back on the rehab cost of the building. Okay. And so between the two, the stacking of the two has been really helpful. Yeah. And then um, up until recently, they could also stack the low-income housing tax credit, but the Ohio State Legislature decided that you can no longer use historic tax credits mm -hmm. with state tax credit, or histor state historic tax credits with low-income housing tax credits, which has caused a pause in some of our projects that were depending on that. Mm -hmm but our, um, some of our local developers like Model Group and Urban Sites are continually to work with the state to find a solution. There's been a lot of TIF dollars and we're actually anticipating over the next 10 years, an additional 20 million of TIF dollars are gonna be created for the two different, the two TIF districts that cover over the Rhine. So there's been, so a lot of 
infrastructure. And then also there's um, the streetcar has helped with, uh, there's a thing called the Vitica, which is a tax put on that helps then fund, fund that and has helped fund the, some of the development around it. Oh yeah, so yeah, so over the Rhine. Um, how many people have been on a tour where they told you what over the Rhine means? Okay, Cincinnati, very German. Um, over the Rhine was a working class German neighborhood and um, the canal, which was on Central Parkway, um, the Miami Erie Canal, it went on the east, will be on Central Parkway at some point. So it was a canal that traveled along the east side or the west side and south of this neighborhood. And so they would say that when you were leaving the Central Business District and you crossed over the canal, it was like you were crossing over the Rhine into Germany because pretty much people spoke German, churches were in German, all the signs were in German. And so it was really like little Germany. In 1850, Cincinnati had the largest German population outside of Germany. So very German, um, loved their beer. Hopefully you guys have been able to partake in our great beer culture that we still have today. Um, and so, yeah, so you'll see a lot of German. One of our newest parks here in Over the Rhine, this is Eagler Park, so it encompasses here as well as over um, on top of that parking garage, it's actually a green space all along that. Um, so this is the old Woodward High School, um, also formerly home of the School of Creative and Performing Arts. Um, Cincinnati Public School System has a lot of um, specialty schools, and the School for the Creative and Performing Arts is one of those where it's actually still the neighborhood school for elementary school kids, but then at junior high and high school, you actually have to audition to get in there. And like Sarah Jessica Parker went to there, the Lachey brothers went there. So um, so they were, they all went to high school here. Um, but this is now called Alumni Lofts. It has been an adaptive reuse into apartments. Um, it, it's 2015 to 16 that it was converted. I think it opened up the end of 2016. Um, and so it's been a really great reuse, a really great example of what can happen to schools that no longer have a student population there. And so shortly after that was done, then Ziegler Park was, was created. Um, so it's, there's a pool there, and that what's great about the pool is that they actually will have specific times for like just the community kids. Um, so, they, so they try to really make sure that the community can get in and it's not just everyone buying day passes or anything. But, if you're still here, you can, I think it's $4 day pass if you're here tomorrow when it's hot and humid and you want to go take a dip. Um, but this was all done with, um, a lot of it was done with TIF money, um, 3CDC, which is uh, the uh, community development organization here in this, in Over the Rhine downtown, um, was the project manager and Human Nature was a, is a local architecture firm that designed it. There's a lot of sustainability features included in here. Um, as I said again, that that's a parking garage and it was really important that the green space stay because there was always a green space with the school and it was really important for the neighborhood to have just a nice large green space and so that was able to be preserved.
So we are um, right at so 15th and Vine. Um, Vine Street is really where um, the kind of the, the redevelopment under 3CDC started. Um, we had crossed Main Street. Main Street had been having work um, on it probably for about 40. It's probably been about 40 years since people had really started doing investment over there. So that happened much more organically over and over the, on um, Main Street. Um, if you walk up Main Street, you'll see it's. Also, say a little grittier sometimes. It's there's it's a little bit more organic in nature. Probably a, a little less um, kind of consistency from building to building. Whereas when 3CDC came came through, they would do it incrementally, block by block. And so it kind of seems a much more complete um, rehab story along Vine Street. Whereas Main Street's kind of still a little more individual building owner by building owner. Um, we also have quite a lot of infill right along here. So there's 15th and Vine, um, there's Perseverance, which is there's a white brick building, and then there's Welcome In, which is a red building that has this like really quite beautiful wave to it. Um, one thing that we've tried really, really hard here is we really want our infill to be able to rise to the level of architecture that our historic architecture is. We have such a rich, beautiful fabric of architecture that our challenge to our design community is you need to do just as beautiful work as our historic buildings because it doesn't do the historic building stock um, justice if we're just putting something that's a cookie cutter that you can find in any city. And we're very lucky that here in Cincinnati we have an amazing design community um, a lot of because of University of Cincinnati, which has one of the best architecture programs in the country. And so they, they've met the challenge. Um, this one right here, 15th and Vine, I would say is probably the first one that has really thought really outside the box and didn't just like what I call safe design where it's um, much more kind of traditional looking. They, they did definitely go outside the box. Um, the uh, copper, um, orange panels are actually terracotta, so it is clay, so similar to brick. Um, and they definitely took, you know, there's, it's definitely not historic, which I think is, is great. Um, but if the building kind of wraps around and it includes historic buildings as well. So there's this one and then along the side, there's actually another building incorporated into this, into this. And so um, being able to incorporate those historic buildings into, into a large format building is challenging. And then the other two that are down here, one's this white brick building, then one has this wave, they're actually both affordable um, housing. And from the outside, you'd never know. And that's actually one of our goals is that you'll never be able to know what building has affordable housing and which one doesn't. We believe that everyone should have the dignity of living in beautiful places and everyone deserves to live in, live in beautiful um, homes and quality housing. 3CDC has been committed over the last several years to that most of their new development has been affordable housing because gentrification has definitely been an issue. Um, in 2000, we had um, over 3,000 affordable units. In 2015, we only had 300 in Over the Rhine. So it's definitely something we have to catch up to. It's something that you know we haven't done the best work in, but we're now trying to, trying to do better. Um, and then we do have organizations like um, there's a Over the Rhine Community Housing, which has been working in Over the Rhine for 30 years, doing affordable housing. And probably on every single block in Over the Rhine is a building that they have touched, but you would never know. They don't brand it with them because they don't want people to say, oh, they know that that's the affordable housing um, developer. So um, so it's, it's great because you just don't know from, from um, building to building, which is part of the goal.
um, was asked while we were writing over, is like, what is the, kind of the build date? Like, what are the, the dates of the buildings here? So the majority of Over the Rhine is between 1850 to the turn of the century, 1900, with I'd say the majority of it being 1870s, 1880s. So um, Italian eight, there's some Greek revival, um, Victorian Gothic um, revival here. So this is Gothic revival. This is Music Hall. Um, this is one of our, we have 11 national historic landmarks in the, in the greater Cincinnati region. This is one of them. Um, this is the home of the, the May Festival, which is going on right now, which you can see that's the, um, the ribbons on there is for the May Festival. This was a major tax credit project in 20, 2016 to 2018. Um, it's the home of the symphony, the opera, Mayfest, and the ballet used to be here, but they just recently built a new building. So it's now just the symphony, opera, um, and Mayfest. And so this was one of the buildings built by Samuel Hannaford. He's the one that built City Hall as well. He also built Memorial Hall. Um, that was his last design that he did before he died. Um, so you can see obviously very different styles of architecture. Um, this is actually, both of these buildings are actually quite unique because the city actually owns Music Hall and they basically lease it to um, the symphony. Um, Memorial Hall is owned by the county and they lease it to 3CDC. So it's kind of an interesting model um, of ownership and running the buildings. Uh, this is Washington Park. This is um, also another park that is a city park, but it's managed by 3CDC. Had a major um, rehabilitation in 2015, um, to tw or 2012 to 2015, I think is when the time period it was. Um, but right now we're actually standing over a parking garage, so it's buried parking. Um, there used to be a school here. It was unfortunately demolished, but the pillar, there's some pillars along um, that street that are still from the school. And there is a pool here as well. Um, when they, I'll say a couple interesting things, when they were building the park, they had to excavate for the parking garage. Well, this used to be a potter's field. So there are lots of bodies that were found. And yeah, there are still some tombstones over there. The south side of the park, there are still bodies buried. We think we know where they all are, but, but we don't no, probably necessarily know if that's 100% accurate. Um, but the bodies that were, families were able to claim, they were able to claim them and rebury them. Any of the other ones were then buried over in Spring Grove Cemetery, which is our large historic cemetery here. Um, and one, one interesting story that I love is that there is one body they came across that she, it was a female. She was buried face down with a stake in her stomach. They believe that she was probably a witch. That, or they, the, at the time they thought that she was a witch. And because if you, it was said that witches could pretend that they're asleep and then they would wake up and they could bear, like come out of the ground. So that way if she started digging, she would just keep going down and not go up. So supposedly that's, that's the story. And um, then another fun, fun fact. So when this was being rehabilitated, I was working with the city and I got a call at about 8.30 on a Saturday morning. They were doing construction and they were digging out underneath the pit. And they're like, we came across bones. Okay. I had to come and sit and babysit the bones until the, archaeolo the contract archeologist could come determine what the bones were. They were animal bones so that we could proceed. But um, that was definitely an interesting moment in my career. This is Ohio's oldest continuously operating public market. So the market and the majority of the ground floor um, spaces are owned by the city and the corporation for Finley Market, which is a 501c3, then operates and manages it. Um, the city used to own the majority of the buildings, all of them from um, the whole buildings, but they've started to condo them out and then sell the upper stories off to get redeveloped. 
Most, a lot of these buildings, the upper stores have been vacant for 15, 20 years. Um, and just the market was still going, but there just wasn't people necessarily living right here. So there's been a, a lot of work over the last several year, years, specifically around Findlay Market. So a lot of the buildings are being, have been rehabbed or are continuously being rehabbed. I'm also, I'm sure as you've walked around just Cincinnati in general, you've seen tons of murals everywhere. And so we have um, Artworks, who is a local nonprofit organization that does a summer program where they hire students to do murals throughout the city. But then we also have a light festival every other year called Blink. If you need something to do the third, I think it's the third week in, or second week in October, um, it is the largest light festival in the entire country. It's phenomenal. It will go from um, a few blocks up, so basically just just at the base of the hill to about 10 blocks into Kentucky. So it spans a lot, a lot of space, lots of really cool light art installations and things like that. Um, but Finley Market has, um, again, we've done a lot of rehabilitation, a lot of work. Um, the, the building here, the substructure is historic, but there has been some kind of additions um, on the outside specifically to enclose it so we can have a little bit more conditioned space on the inside. Um, but we're very proud of it. It did win the APA Best, Best Places Award um, a few years back. Um, so it's something we're really proud of. So we are on Dayton Street. This is 812 Dayton Street, the John Houck House. This is the home of Cincinnati Preservation Association. The area that we just passed through is part of the West End. Um, once we crossed over Central Parkway, that we left over the Rhine and came over into the West End. This is what they referred to as Millionaire's Row back in the day. John Houck House was a, was a beer baron. Um, if you guys haven't heard, Cincinnati's a little bit of a beer town. Historically, we had uh, so much beer and so many beer drinkers that we actually had to import beer rather than export it because the people that drank beer, on average, it was 40 gallons a year per capita. That's including men, women, and children. They liked beer. And so John was a beer baron um, of the second largest pre-prohibition brewery. We've owned this building on and off since the 60s when our organization was started. Our organization is turning 60 years this year. This is our home. This is where our offices are. Um, we have a preservation planning architecture library on the first floor and then our offices up on the second floor. And this section is where the wealthy people lived before really the inclines and people were able to get up onto the mountains, onto the mountains, onto the, <laughs> they sometimes feel like mountains when you're trying to bike up them, um, up on the hills. So you can definitely see these buildings are a little bigger then what was in Over the Rhine? Over the Rhine was a working neighborhood where a lot of the workers lived. The brewery, there's a lot of breweries where we just passed by. If you saw the big Kaiser Pickle Factory, that actually used to be the Hauk Brewery or the land that the Hauk Brewery was on. And so now they make pickles and not beer. You can still love both. So there's recently been a lot of work coming on Dayton Street. This is the oldest historic district. It was established in 1976. Um, so it was our very first historic district. It's our oldest historic district and still lots of work, lots of work going on. Um, we're trying to be in the West End here a lot more intentional about kind of incremental rehabilitation here. 
Um, the West End is very, very sensitive to gentrification. They've seen what has happened in Over the Rhine, and the citizens over here are very sensitive to it. The football stadium was kind of a little bit of a blow to the neighborhood and to their population. Um, there was a community benefits agreement that hasn't truly, I think, been fulfilled yet, so there is still hope. Um, but most of the developers and most of the rehab along this street has been individual owners, and it hasn't really been the developers. There is a building, um, we'll, we'll pass by it, it's gonna be this big school on the right called Lafayette Bloom. The port owns it and is trying to turn it, um, working, has an RFP right now um, for it, hoping to turn it into um, market rate housing um, because there is there is a balance in this neighborhood. We have a lot of affordable housing. We want to keep the affordable housing, but they also don't necessarily, the neighborhood doesn't want to continue to have the concentration. They want to have a really good mixed income community. And so we're intentionally, I think, the neighborhood's really intentionally trying to take it slower here and not necessarily do the kind of the blitz that kind of happened in Over the Rhine. So we'll, we'll see if it's successful or not. Um, you know, two different models. And so we, we can see. Union Terminal. Um, Union Terminal is um, was our was a train station. Is now a uh, our history local history museum. So let's go in because it is one of the most stunning, stunning interiors you will ever see. So we're going to just go in and take a peek. It's the largest half dome in the country. I would say it's one of the Art Deco masterpieces in the United States. I'm probably a little biased, but obviously has one of the best views of downtown. And it really never met its full potential as a train station because built 1933, went into the depression, then the highway system came. However, luckily we are very happy that there was uh, recently, if anybody are stamp people, there was a train, a set of train stamps, and this was one of the stamps and the uh, unveiling or dedication of those stamps was actually here, which is really quite cool. Um, and then if you look here and you look over here towards the river, you see this large industrial area. Um, we went under the highway. Um, this whole area used to be as dense, if not denser than over the Rhine. It was a thriving, 
black neighborhood. It's called the West, so we kind of went through the West End when we went through Dayton Street. Well, the West End came all the way over here. The highway split that neighborhood in half, displaced 40,000 families, almost all of them were black, in the name of blight. Um, we luckily have pictures of almost every single building that was demolished, and you look at it, it, was, it wasn't blighted. Um, it was obviously an excuse to justify getting rid of that neighborhood. Um, the, the black neighborhood was then, the black population that was there was then displaced and dispersed um, throughout the city, uh, mostly in Avondale, Evanston, um, Walnut Hills. Um, the black community has just really never quite recovered from there. There is still some really deep pain um, in the community from that. The city last year did finally um, make apologies for it. The government never made apologies prior to that. It was always, well, it wasn't our administration that did it, but it, it was still the city, right? So um, I will give a lot of props to the council that is here now because they, um, council member Scotty Johnson did lead the efforts to apologize. So now the next step is we are looking at what can we do to, re to further repair the neighborhood and do some reparations for the hurt that has happened to the black community here in Cincinnati because of the destruction of their neighborhood back in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, so, um, so 75 is the one of the, the busiest highway systems in the United States. It goes all the way from Canada all the way down to Florida. And um, obviously when it came through here in the 40s and 50s, it destroyed the neighborhood. Well, it's Brent Spence Bridge is being expanded. Um, and it's not actually taking too much properties over here. Um, there's one historic property that is getting a little bit of it demolished. But with the Brent Spence corridor, it's gonna create, I think there's, it's yet to be seen what the end result will be. There is a movement called Bridge Forward that is trying to reduce the footprint to regain more property. Um, there's definitely some design challenges of trying to bring back connections to from this side to the other side. I still think a lot of it has yet to be determined kind of what the final impact will be. Um, I would say yes, we need the, that bridge is scary. Uh, I, th I think anybody that's local does not like to go across that river or go across that bridge. It has definitely has more traffic than it was designed for and it's necessary, but it's kind of one of those like double-edged sword. Yeah, so there's one neighborhood over there that um, it's called Lewisburg and it's, sorry, in, over there, Kentucky. Um, we love Kentucky. It's the greater part of greater Cincinnati. I always do like to say that. Um, and so that, that neighborhood was another neighborhood that was destroyed by, by this. And they're now getting another, I think 50 buildings demolished in their neighborhood. It's a National Register Historic District. And so that is a little bit heartbreaking. So it's, it's gonna be 10 plus year project. I don't think any of us are locally or necessarily looking forward <laughs> to that construction. get back to the red bike. So this is the Cincinnati Fire Museum. Um, I think any city is always proud of like the first that they are, right? And so Cincinnati had the first professional fire um, department in the country. Um, the Fire Museum tells that story. Um, it is a, it, they do a lot of really cool programming for kids, a lot of like fire safety things, um, but they're just a great, a great resource. And our um, fire department is really proud of this. They're the fire, People are here often with the kids. Um, so it's just a really neat, um, neat amenity we have. Um, and also I'd be remiss if I didn't say Cincinnati, of course, is also 
the, has the first professional baseball team, the Reds. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. And I, one thing I did forget to say when I was at John Houck's house, um, John Houck is the reason we have beer with baseball. So we can thank Cincinnati and thank John Houck. John Houck was a brewer who bought the Reds because they were, were struggling financially. He bought the Reds and he said, oh, I sell beer. I will sell the beer at the baseball. And the marriage began. So we can thank Cincinnati and we can thank John Houck for baseball and beer, which are a perfect pairing. Um, so this is Cincinnati City Hall, um, Richardsonian Romanesque. In the 1950s, they actually wanted to tear this down. We're Sorry. glad they didn't, right? Um, it's amazing. It's a beautiful building. Um, we're very lucky to still have it. There was actually recently a book done about city halls across the country, and this was featured in it uh, about the Richardsonian Romanesque style. And this is just a really unique corner uh, because we have City Hall, we have Plum Street Temple, which is um, the Isaac Wise Temple. Isaac Wise was the founder of Reform Judaism. And then we have St. Peter in Chains, which is the um, Archdiocese, our cathedral here in Cincinnati. And so it's really kind of neat because it's like you have the government and these two major religious institutions here and obviously Catholic and Judaism right across the street. And I'll say it is actually quite beautiful um, during like Passover, the cathedral will have stuff like have banners like happy Passover um, at Christmas, they'll have Merry Christmas. So it's like, there's a really great, beautiful relationship between the institutions. And then also, sorry, right up here, you obviously can't see it from here, but this is our Black Lives mural um, out in front of City Hall. Um, all, every single letter was painted by a local black artist. Oh, thank, yeah. you. thank you, Bicycle Shepherds. Yes. Yeah. Yay. And again, a huge thank you to Beth Johnson, Executive Director of the Cincinnati Preservation Association for this amazing historical tour. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>